Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefield and as always and you're probably getting tired of it but I hope you're not. Namaste and in la catch come from two ancient languages both with similar meanings. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken it's called Brahmi and it simply means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In La Ketch comes from the other side of the world, the Mayan civilization, and it simply means I am another you. So here's two civilizations. Maybe we can learn something from and apply today. I challenge you to do so in your everyday meeting of people. Have, have that kind of perspective in mind when you approach them. Don't believe me? Try it. See what kind of difference it makes. Thanks. All right, this week's guest is Leon uh, Lion Goodman. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Clear Beliefs Institute. He trains business and executive coaches how to clear their clients' limiting beliefs, disrupt old patterns of thought, and remove blockages to success. He's a member of the International Coach Federation, which is where he got at least one of his certifications as a professional certified coach. He also graduated from the University of Colorado at Boulder with a degree in consciousness studies. Beautiful place, Boulder. And he's co-author of Creating on Purpose, the spiritual technology of manifesting through the chakras. Lion, pleasure to have you. Thanks for being here, Zen. It's a great pleasure for me. Well, awesome. It, it, these conversations are always wonderful and it gives me the opportunity to just get to know people globally and, and have really great conversations that matter and not just between us that give the opportunity for people to listen in and reflect on their own lives and their attitudes and beliefs and how they might be able to change them to make them better. So that being said, I'm sure you've had a, a rich beginning. You know, a lot of my guests have this inner knowing or inkling or situations that happen young that give them an indication of there's more to life than the outer world, that there's actually a, an inner world too. Did you have something like that happen? And, and what was that like? I was a weird kid. <laughs> <laughs> I love weird kids. I was one too. Yeah. Uh, I think weird kids have a particular advantage in the world, except that they don't know it at the time. I certainly didn't. Yeah. I thought there was something wrong with me, which is why, you know, I didn't have friends. I couldn't make friends. I was kind of alone and separate. Um, I now understand my psychology and where it came from. But the, the essence is, is that I felt alone most of the time. I didn't really know how to connect with others. And I became became an observer of other people, other kids. And I thought maybe if I could figure out how they were, who they were, I could become normal too. And uh, I'd like to say that fortunately after, you know, decades and decades of study, I've never become normal, thank God. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, growing up is a trap. <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it, uh, it it did teach me that there's nothing wrong with me. Essentially, uh, there's nothing wrong with any of us. Where we have issues and we have problems, and but they can be solved. They can be cleared up Absolutely. Uh, through some deep inner work. So um, I was an early explorer. I was uh, in elementary school. I was studying the brain. In junior high school, I studied ESP and reincarnation. Uh, by the time I got into high school, I was into all the sciences and psychology and trying to understand who we are. And then in college, I met an incredible teacher who reflected back. He was my first kind of teacher, coach, guru, therapist, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a brilliant man who, who said, uh, who asked the great questions. What is the nature of human nature? What is the nature of human motivation? What is the nature of life? Why are we here? And he thought the questions were more interesting than the answers. But he said, everything you study can be applied to yourself. So if you're studying physics, you're studying the physics of who you are in the world and how the world is. If you're studying psychology, you're studying your own psychology. So he made everything relevant to me in college. And I've given that advice to many college students. You know, sure. apply everything to yourself and then everything becomes interesting. 
Now, did you find when you were younger and, and you were, as you mentioned, you were observing and, and watching and, and I would offer you were looking for patterns of behavior that allowed you to enter when you so chose because of the opening that it provided, right? This is, would you say that this is kind of an example of early re pattern recognition of unpacking the chaos around you in the ways that certain patterns began to appear, those patterns of behavior with other kids, right, that allowed you to understand their motivations a little better and then to enter where you chose as opposed to just jumping in and figuring it out. The pattern recognition system is key to our survival. In fact, we have it while still in the womb. <clears throat> Babies in the womb can identify the difference between their mother's voice and their father's voice, and they respond differently to those two voices. So pattern recognition and then we use using those patterns for survival is, is actually the basis of the belief system, the belief structure, which I call the, the infrastructure of the human mind or the human operating system. And we're from the very beginning, we are looking for what do I need to do to survive? And we recognize the patterns. When this face comes close, I feel cuddled, warm, and fed. When that face comes close, I feel prickly and weird and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, so babies are looking for patterns all the time. And then when they find a pattern that works, they use that for survival. If I cry and make a fuss, <clears throat> I'll be taken care of. That's a that's a first belief. It's a behavioral one. It's an experiential one. They don't have words yet, so they're not thinking about it. But essentially, they recognize that if I do this, then this happens, right? Now, mm -hmm. the problem with beliefs and constructs like this is that they don't automatically disappear. So we layer our constructs over on top of each other uh, till we have tens of thousands of them. And it takes conscious work to clear the old ones. So right. you, may, you may know people, I certainly do, who are still operating on the principle that if I cry and make a fuss, I'll be taken care of. And they're adults, right? So, so that is the basis of the belief structure, which is what I study and what I teach about. Uh, because it, to me, it's the most interesting thing. And it's the best leverage for personal change and growth. Sure. And, and being able to, so how did you first, uh, with that great, teacher mentor guide that you had initially and and the instilling of the questions right and i agree the questions are far more important than the answers and how did this begin to unpack you to you uh, wow such a such an important question <laughs> a deep one um, when I was, when I entered college, uh, I, I was interested in the experimental studies program, which they had at the time. This was back in the seventies where they were trying to figure out how to keep kids in school and not go out and riot in the streets. Right. So, so, uh, one of the first programs I did, uh, was, uh, 20 of us went on outward bound together and then A lived phenomenal together. program. What's that? Phenomenal program. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were doing winter mountaineering. So the first night we were camped out in the snow, it was 40 below zero. That was a big awakening for me. <laughs> it's how cold it can get. Um, but we also were doing sort of psychological exercises and we lived together in kind of a commune and got university credit for it. So uh, someone found this book called The Syllabus of Survival in one of the, the drawers of a cabin and uh, came out and started reading it to us. It was amazing. And so the people started visiting this teacher. He had his own school in the mountains called the Adventure Trails Survival School and Brain Laboratory. Uh, his name was T.D. Lingo. Uh, and so when, when I met him, I thought, I, I know this guy somehow. And I, I remembered that when I was eight years old, I was in the Cub Scouts and my dad had taken me to this father and son dinner for the Cub Scouts. And they, there was this guy up on stage who played the guitar and sang folk songs and I was very impressed with him because he used the word damn in one of his songs in front of our fathers. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And right. I heard about this school, this, this camp that he had, and I asked to go and my father said no. But um, when I first met Lingo, that's, that's what he went by, um, he remembered that incident. He remembered my father. He remembered, you know, being there. And so I had met him at eight and it was kind of inevitable that I met him again at, at 19 uh, and I studied with him for four years. 
and he had had three degrees from the University of Chicago. He had been a World War II veteran. He had made himself into a folk singer to get on TV. He had, <laughs> I mean, he was an amazing guy. But sure, he truly was really an edutainer. Yes, exactly. Um, but he asked me the questions. He had processes for getting me to think and feel and experience, remember. And he was the one that said the answers are in the brain. If we understood the brain, we would understand human behavior. And so that got me into neurology, neurophysiology, anatomy. Uh, and so we, we learned how to use how the brain works to alter our consciousness. Now, I was also using drugs for that purpose uh, mm -hmm. and exploring you know, different I kinds of I can relate to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I became fascinated by what is consciousness? What is, how does it work? What do we have? Why are we here? Uh, all the great questions. And that, that made me an explorer for my whole life. Yeah, me too. I, I, same, a little bit older for me. I was, eight, I was 18. Uh, my first year in college, I had... Um, being an orphan and adopted and, and taking a route that I thought would be good because my uncle was a general practitioner, doctor. And so I began on a pre-med program. But after the first quarter, I came back and I was just really bereft of, of direction and internally. And so I hit my knees and I actually prayed to know what truth was. And I was willing to die for it if necessary. Be careful, right? Yeah. Uh, the following, yeah, exactly. The following Tuesday, I came back from class, did the obligatory bong hit, and album side meditation. It was 11 11 1975. And during this meditation, I'm laying across my dorm room bed, I'm listening to Journey's first album, a song called In the Morning Day. And right before the in between the vocals and, and the uh, jam session, right. I hear this voice that I've been familiar with since a, a child. It says, you know, my given name's Bruce. It says, Bruce, are you willing to die for what you believe in? And after I kind of, you know, clenched for a moment, I thought, okay, what do I believe in? Christ consciousness was first. It felt a little empty. I wasn't sure why. Didn't question, just moved on. Cosmic consciousness. Yeah, that feels full. Yes. Right. And then a guitar riff comes up that sounds like a rocket ship taking off. I get a pull from my solar plexus, I pop out of my body, look at my body on my dorm room bed and turn back to look where I'm going. And immediately I'm engulfed by white light, right? So this sensation of leaving and entering and then the observation from a self-awareness standpoint of observing my own senses in that moment of this high-pitched iridescent effervescent feeling of home right and still individuated and yet part of this collective of this massive infinite intelligence and then the impetuous teenager comes up and says wow is there more and not thinking right because it got boring and i feel this movement and i'm in an indigo background with points of light surrounding me and i intuitively knew the points of light were points of consciousness not realizing this was the experience of cosmic consciousness right and uh, I knew that they were um, somehow in body as well, even though I wasn't sure at that point because I knew I wasn't. And then the voice picked back up and basically said that I'm to work with these in order to help facilitate a new world order in my lifetime. Well, that was, you know, there was a few more things that came along with that. But then returning from that place, understanding that there is no death, and that, they, that we're all cosmic consciousness condensed into form, just unaware of that, gave me a real good foundation to be really weird with, right? Because <laughs> all those kinds of things, uh, you know, I told my parents about it. First thing they had me do was see a psychiatrist. That's of course. <laughs> of course. Was, yeah. And what a godsend, though. I, I, he listened to me for the first three visits, and he finally says, you know, you're not crazy. You've had a spiritual awakening. Don't know why so young. Most people don't have it until their mid forties if they ever do. And ultimately my advice is don't talk to anybody about it because they're not going to understand you. Wow. What, you are so fortunate to have that, that particular psychiatrist who knew that because you could have also been put in an institution. And was the following year because I didn't keep my mouth shut. Ah. And my parents thought it was, yeah, it was, um, 
interesting period, learned a lot, came out of it uh, with a lot more strength than I had going into it as I had to learn that my truth is okay. It doesn't matter what others believe about me. It's like you were talking earlier in that uh, patterned, you know, the, the building of, of the layers of patterns and the cognitive dissonance that comes with that so easily. Now, how did you, uh, in, in your, I know you mentioned that, you know, the experimentation, I know that that's one of the ways to free your mind of its constraints. How did you find that experience and, and what were some of the insights that came along with it, if you wouldn't mind sharing? So college was this grand exploration of, of all of the sciences and psychology and dance and mime and music and, you know, everything I could get my hands on, um, including electronics. You know, I put on the first, one of the first um, concerts using an EEG to drive a Moog synthesizer back in the 70s. That's fascinating. That, that's <laughs> we, awesome. We yeah. called it Mind Over Moog. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, and this teacher also taught us how to use power politics. He said, look, you know, you've got this whole university at your beck and call. And so he taught us how to create an organization. We could then use the, all the facilities, the auditoriums and put on events. So I became an event producer also. Um, and it was all about consciousness. In fact, a couple of years later, we put on the celebration of consciousness out in the big park in, in Boulder, uh, with, you know, 40 different presenters. And so we were early, uh, uh, early broadcasters of, sure. of consciousness. Anything that had to do with consciousness, I was interested in. So I'd followed gurus and they did meditations and yoga and, you know, everything that came through Boulder, which was pretty much everything uh, and, I would participate I have a friend in. that actually um, was the marketing director for Naropa for a while. Right. Well, Naropa was, was just blossoming when I was there in the 70s. Yeah. And so We'd sit around and wait for Trungpa Rinpoche to show up, and he'd show up three hours later, drunk. And uh, it, was, <laughs> it taught me a few things about gurus. Um, anyway, right. I, was, I was really in the midst of that that whole scene, uh, and so for me, everything was interesting. Uh, every state of consciousness was interesting. I could learn something from anything. And, uh, but I began building my own understanding of what consciousness was, how it was connected to the brain, how it wasn't connected to the brain. Uh, and it wasn't until after I graduated uh, with a degree in consciousness studies that I found out that nobody was hiring people with degrees in consciousness studies. <laughs> so, so, so I, you know, I was an economic human being as well as a, uh, as well as a cosmic consciousness being. Uh, sure. And so I needed to make money. So I ended up uh, gathering some different products and sales, uh, jewelry and gift items and going on the road uh, selling them. All right. So I was living in a van exploring the Southwest United States, traveling from city to city and selling my wares. And, and then I had my out-of-body experience when I, when I had picked up this guy whose car had broken down in the desert. And uh, he traveled with, with me for three days. I grew to trust him, said I'm on errands, that kind of thing, as I was selling my wares. And the third night out, he pulled out a gun and shot me four times in the head. Ouch. Yeah. And so that, and that was no the No precursive awareness or anything thing to indicate that he was a little off center no in fact that's the moment i rec recognized that i was not as psychic as i thought i was <laughs> no doubt <laughs> yeah. so uh, oh man getting shot in the head four times that that's um that's almost impossible to wrap your mind around yes Let alone the fact that you're here talking with me in full consciousness and able to speak and be and as if nothing had happened well, it was my awakening experience. I was, uh, I, I, will, I won't tell the whole story. I've written about it. It's been made into a movie. I mean, it's- Sure, it's, and we'll have links insane. on that. Yeah, um, but I, I I was out of my body expecting to go home, right? <clears throat> I was floating outside my body. So I was able to look down and see this little van with these two little beings in it. And I thought that was very amusing, you know, kind of looked like looking at a dollhouse. And I was that point of consciousness outside my body, you know, filled with light and love. And, you know, I said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go home. Um, and then when the fourth bullet hit me, it, 
it sent my head flying sideways and blood was rushing out and I was suddenly back in my body. Mm. And um, I wasn't sure what where the bullet had gone, but I had studied anatomy and physiology enough to know that I ought to be missing something. And so I'm kind of checking my body uh, and uh, nothing seemed to be missing. And so I, I thought, well, I'm here. I'm, I'm back in my body, not out of my body. So I at least want to look my assassin in the eyes. And so I picked up my head and I turned and looked at him. He was to my left and I was crouched down in this position where I couldn't move or defend myself. And he freaked out. And he said, why aren't you dead, man? You're supposed to be dead. And I didn't know the answer to that question. I just said, here, here I am. Mm -hmm. so I was still in this cosmic state. And he said, I, sh I shot you four times, man. I shot you four times. Why aren't you dead? And then he said, it's too weird. It's just like my dream this morning. And I said, what dream? And he said, I dreamt that I was shooting at this guy and he wouldn't die, but it wasn't you. It was somebody else in the dream. And I had a similar thought to you uh, saying, uh, how did I get into this movie? And uh, I don't remember signing up to be an actor in this, in this <laughs> screenplay. You know? uh, yeah. uh, and I thought if I could keep him talking, he might not shoot me. And so I tried to talk with him and he was all adrenalated because he had just tried to kill the me. The trigger several times. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and uh, to make a long story really short, we ended up talking for eight hours. And, um, and I was still filled with love and light. So he was included in it. You know, I was in the compassionate place and he transformed, I transformed. And eventually we made a deal. We let each other go. And I took myself to the hospital where the doctor said that two bullets had grazed my skull. And I realized I had a very hard aura and uh, the bullets had not the skull, skull right? <laughs> right. So, uh, so, so that was my experience of, of really being completely out of body, recognizing that I was not the body, that right. I was a point of consciousness and that I had a choice about who to be and where to be. Now in, in your, what an awesome experience to, and <laughs> unpleasant one, absolutely, to reach that state. As you began looking deeper into that in, in the years that followed, you know, the, traditionally, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences happen with some kind of trauma, right? Mine it was just kind of some emotional trauma. I didn't have any other thing, so it was more volitional, where yours was, was precipitated by an event mm -hmm. that you did not have any control over whatsoever, or so we think, right? There is that school of thought that we map everything out and we choose all our experiences and everything's just perfect even these kinds of events that you experienced is did you find that what did you find as you dove deeper into the nature of being consciousness and and the implications that you found that brought forth a, a, an understanding of how to live well, the first decision I made is I, it took me about a month to kind of put my life back together. Um, I stayed in LA, which is where it happened and kind of started life over. I wanted to get off the road, <laughs> first of all. So right. I was going to repeat with, that one. Right, right. right. Um, uh, the thing I, I think I realized most was that um, clearly I'm, I'm in control in some way of my life. And I was kind of floating around and I had been thinking maybe I would go to medical school, maybe get a PhD in psychology. And I really was lost. I was just kind of spending time drifting for a while until I figured it out. Mm -hmm. I thought, and for a lot of people, a near death experience will, will make, take them from being very practical and earthbound to being very spiritual. Mm -hmm. Mine did the opposite. I was already spiritual and it actually grounded me. And I said, okay, I need a real job. <laughs> I need to find a real job. And, get my feet on the ground. And so I became a headhunter. I was hired by a company and was made a, a headhunter, which I thought was ironic after having my head hunted, becoming a headhunter. <laughs> I was gonna make that comment. <laughs> but that started a 25 year career in executive search. Uh, and it got me grounded and I made money and I got married and had a kid and you know did the householder thing. But all the while, I was also on weekends and evenings doing workshops and trainings and shamanic practices and 
and meditations and, you know, and I was learning everything I could. It actually spurred my interest in consciousness mm -hmm. and I wanted to learn what everybody else knew. So I was gathering all this information and, um, and it, I just kept putting the pieces together into understanding who we are, why we're here, what life is about, uh, all the, and especially the multidimensionality of consciousness that it's not one thing it's there's many dimensions and as dimensional multidimensional beings we can experience any aspect of the universe because we're part of it that's a very interesting observation mm -hmm. and and awareness right <clears throat> because for me uh, and i can only speak from my direct experience just as you right in that exploration that i had to understand okay here's this notion of cosmic consciousness condensing into form well how does it do that and then over the years it's like okay there's bandwidth right <laughs> and then there's vibrational bandwidth that seems to be associated with the chakras which is part of what you wrote about and then what else and then uh, years later i i run into the um understanding of the sofagio tones and then the understanding of the spiral dynamics model and then as i was preparing for an interview with dr jeffrey mishlev i was looking through him some of their old uh, his old shows to kind of get an idea of how to respond you know be my prep work right and i ran into an interview with a guy named um vernon neppy and his he and edward close developed a model of um they call it the triadic dimensional distinction vortical paradigm where they it's a mouthful <laughs> isn't it though uh, tdvp for short right but nobody understands that and it echoed my direct experience of a multi-plane awareness procedure that william swigert had developed back in the 50s that i experienced in 1989 and that being of nine planes of consciousness that we have bodies on each that we integrate all in that perfected form, fit, and function in the world when all of those dimensions are lined up. Now, Nepi and Close posit it as consciousness, space, and time being tethered across nine dimensions of consciousness not excluding other dimensions, just saying for humans, that's our threshold for now until we learn more. But I found that those kinds of things, and of course, this was a 30-year process, right, of getting all of these different pieces to go, hmm, right? And that's about all you could do is, hmm, kind of makes sense, right? Now, what do you do with it? what have you experienced in that process and what were the questions that you came up with as far as what to do with it well i'm also a fan of models and i've looked at probably a hundred different models of consciousness and one of my favorite sayings is from the statistician george box who said all models are wrong some are useful and so for me, it's like every model is interesting. It's one person's perspective on who we are and how we're organized and what the planes of existence are and how, how consciousness works. And, there, and some of the models are very useful. And you, for example, if you have a model of ascending states of consciousness, you know that there's possibilities of achieving those states of consciousness. If there's a model of business that works, you can use that model to do business, right? So models are useful. Uh, but you have to be careful not to buy into a model as if true, whether it's Jesus and Christianity or Islam and Allah or, or uh, Judaism and the Torah or, <clears throat> or, um, or scientism, you know, where it's right. all, it's all material and, uh, and it's just billiard, billiard balls interacting with each other. So I find it really important to stay in that place of not knowing and saying, it's interesting model. I wonder how it can be used. I'm very practical of mind. Right. So in my training, uh, the Clear Beliefs Coach training, I teach people many models. And I say, these are just models. And they're useful for these reasons. Use them, get your experience with them, and then let go of the model because it's just a model. Right. Kind of glean what 
is there for you and then move on yes ask more questions and find out totally agree yeah. and, and and true with all of that you know it's like the saying you're so spiritual you're no earthly good well it, you have to be in that practical and pragmatic state for it all to work yeah well, we're here for a reason we're in bodies we're in the physical universe um i like to tell people because i i uh, my currency is beliefs right that um a lot of people say well if, if your beliefs create your reality um then create a beer in my hand <laughs> and, right. and that's a valid question right because if your beliefs create your reality you should be able to create physical reality but the fact is is that there's not just one universe in which your beliefs can create your reality there's multiple universes one mm -hmm. of which is our personal universe of of our experience feelings thoughts ideas sensations philosophies points of view uh and i've got one and you've got one that's a whole universe over there and just like in lakesh right i, I recognize your universe of of self there i thou um and but then there's also a social universe which is the universe of you and i mm -hmm. and there's different rules of creation and in the, that universe in that universe we exchange and we communicate and we negotiate and we we you know create together we co-create uh by working together and collaborating um but that social universe is encased in an even larger universe called the physical universe and that was here before we were so it was pre-created we come into it we don't get to create create it it's pre-created but what we can do is we can manipulate it and we can and learn how to play it well it. in it That's right yes exactly so uh so beliefs are in the personal universe and you can create anything in fact i i uh, ask people to try on beliefs to see what they feel like to recognize what how beliefs impact our feelings you want to do a little experiment for and do it with our audience oh sure great i'm, all, I'm always up for experiments good so so close your eyes i am one moment. yeah i did yes i see that we were our brothers in this experimental <laughs> beingness exactly <laughs> so close your eyes for a moment and feel what it feels like to hold the belief there's something wrong with me as if it's true just try it on like trying on clothes at a clothing mm -hmm. store and feel what it feels like when you believe that okay and what do you what do you notice mm, constriction mm -hmm. where do you notice the constriction hmm heart space descending into gut space mm -hmm. beautiful and that's that's pretty typical for that particular belief everybody has a particular feeling in themselves but there's patterns there's similarities sure. so let that one go like take the clothes off that you just tried on and went yeah you know get rid of it all right and now try on the belief i am a sacred and worthy being and say that to yourself and feel what that one feels like total expansion from every cell of my body now that's because I've practiced that well it turns out that everybody who tries this experiment feels some part of that sensation yeah. because our beliefs create our experiential reality so so when you try on a belief you can feel it you can also use this backwards you can go from a feeling and ask what belief has created this feeling so that's a very useful practical tool for understanding the self is there also the possibility okay because from the indigenous philosophies three brain i'm sure you're familiar with gut the heart the head we process in that order as opposed to the <laughs> allopathic method if you will of you know what's on top of your shoulders and you're not unaware of the heart and the gut from the gut though is uh, that understanding of vibrations connectivity our access to the physiology of creation if you will from that vibrational space is that a um, an addition to or a place to reside in asking those questions of what does this sensation mean as opposed to why do i feel this way 
Well, we are meaning making animals. Meaning making is part of the structure of this belief system. Meaning is this is this means this. It's uh, one of my friends calls it is glue. You know, mm, dog right. is soft. <laughs> I am uh, a father. It's like so there's it's, no issues. It's all ish me's. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> Uh, so, so we aren't, we do take our experiences and make meaning out of them. And this is part of the belief structure. So our experience is multidimensional. We've mm -hmm. agreed on that. Uh, if our beliefs come out of our experience, then beliefs are multidimensional. And if we want to change a belief, we have to change it multidimensionally. And so as a being, what you were describing is the recognition that, you know, that there's many dimensions. That's a state of being that came out of experience that came out of some, it got you there somehow mm -hmm. and you now kind of open up the channels because you don't believe that you're this limited person with a head on top of a body that carries it around so you have expanded your sense of self to include much more than just your ego mm -hmm. and that comes from experiences it also comes from your beliefs when we right. we, we open up our identity beliefs which are the i am beliefs then we can be anything and we open up the whole universe to us and that's the we are yeah right um it, it is it is one. And the um yeah absolutely one and individuated in multiple ways that ultimately that's what i referred to as the perfected form fit and function in the world we all have one it's by our it's our nature it's our design and we're kind of seeking that or hopefully doing that especially coming out of the pandemic when the uh, obsession on self hygiene and sequestration hopefully got people to turn inside and examining themselves right what are my beliefs how how do i behave how do i want to behave what's what's real to me what's true and what am i willing to die for me for right Not and die. even more importantly what are you willing to live for absolutely absolutely <laughs> that is the key above and beyond and we're oftentimes looking at it backwards right what how do we live what do we live for not managing all the things that are keeping us from it and focusing on that and losing our attention to it um, right we have a limited amount of attention we wake up in the morning with a bucket full of attention and then we distribute it based on what we're interested in or where what catches our attention and we obviously live in a in a attention marketplace right everybody's trying oh, yeah. to get your attention and grab your eyeballs um and so uh at the end of the day your attention is exhausted and that's why you go to sleep to fill up your bucket again and so the ability to control your attention and choose consciously is key to living a good life because otherwise everybody else is directing your attention, directing your consciousness, using you as a source of energy uh, or, or dollars if they're trying to sell you something. <clears throat> and so, yeah. uh, so that ability to manage your attention is, is key to self-growth. Now, do you find that in that place of managing your attention, where you focus your intention coupled with your intention and interaction is where the manifestations occur. Well said. It, I like to look at the roots of words and attention comes from the Latin ad tendere. Tendere means to stretch. It's where we get the word from tendon from, right? Okay. Uh, and so when we put our attention on something, we stretch toward it. I'm looking at you, so my attention is being stretched toward you. Right. When I look at my intention, I'm looking I'm stretching inward, right, to find out what's inside. And the combination of, of knowing my intention and stretching out my attention will get me forward. And so interaction is part of that social universe. We can't do anything alone. We're, we're social creatures. And so we need each other. And we need to learn the tools of interaction, the tools of relationship, the tools of collaboration, cooperation mm -hmm. in order to survive. And this is built into our animal nature. You know, monkeys are very tribal. Uh, they will cooperate within their tribe, but then they'll compete with other tribes. So that part is ancient in us. Uh, and so we have to be socialized to recognize that we really still haven't learned tribe. how to get along together, have yeah. we? Right. We're all one. We're, when we recognize we're all one tribe, 
then it's easier to get along. We were talking about before the call, we were talking about the enemy. You know, if we if you can tell someone that they're the enemy, then their attention will be defensive toward that person and they will be separated from them rather than find out, oh, you're another me. And, and oftentimes it seems like the, the query, the questions that we ask of others that cause either critical thinking or deep introspection are threats and they're perceived as aggressive acts by many. And I often wondered, well, why is this? Because these are just natural questions that come up for me. I examine myself that way. And I'm, it sounds like you do too. What do you think are the ways to minimize or even mitigate that defensive posture with questions? Is that done through uh, better gesticulation, body language, tone of voice, um, words that are used with the questions? Because, you know, we come into this, we don't know. We're, we're exploring, we're experimenting, just like you and I were moments ago. And we each have a different dictionary from which we're speaking and listening from in most cases. How do we find congruence in that? How do you promote that? Well, as my wife says and teaches, the how matters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how you ask the question matters. Um, if you're asking it as a probe and you're using it to needle somebody, they're going to get defensive. If, if you're in open space and you're curious and and you ask the question, wow, that's that's amazing that you you understand it that way. How did you come to that understanding? That's a non-defensive way of asking a question, uh, asking a question, what do they believe? Um, I like the question, um, how's that belief working for you? <laughs> because that causes the person to reflect, go, what do you mean it's a belief? It's, it's, oh, maybe it is a belief. Right. Um, uh, or I, or sometimes I'll just say, that's an interesting belief. Right. And I'm not being defensive and not saying their belief is wrong. I'm just pointing out how interesting it sure. is. And that causes them to self-reflect. So um, it, uh, our ego is built of these beliefs about who I am. And we're built on a very fragile structure. So that when our when our I, when our beliefs about ourselves get poked by somebody, that's when we get defensive. How how dare you come into my self preservation mode and tell me that I'm not who I believe I am? Now let's go back. Let's step in the wayback machine for just a minute, along with Sherman and Peabody, and go into <laughs> the when that when you recognize that happening in yourself. Right, where someone began questioning you, maybe it was your mentor in, in college. What did you go through in confronting yourself? Well, my teacher Lingo was very, very good at forming questions for self-reflection. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunately trained very early how to do that, to look inside and to examine inside and to go deep inside and go, hmm, what is it? What am I made of? So uh, he really taught me how to ask those questions in a way that were that did not make me defensive, uh, mm -hmm. that, that caused self awareness. And it all starts with self awareness. You know, my favorite thing I made up was you know in an emergency apply awareness first. Yeah. So uh, so it is the, uh, a gentle process. If you force someone to awaken, they will nail you to a cross. Uh, that's what happened to Jesus. <laughs> he was he was pushing people to awaken, and they didn't like it very much. So right. they killed him. And most prophets who have who have met that end are people who were saying there's something wrong with you, and you need to you need to get fixed. Right. And unfortunate as that is, it also gives us a way to see our history and and to understand that when we feel aggressed upon, our initial reaction is to aggress rather than take a moment and say, wait a minute, I am, I don't want to feel this way or, or I, there's no real threat from this other person. So why am I feeling like I need to aggress, right? How do I remain in that ambivalent self-reflecting state as opposed to being triggered by someone else. 
Have you got a, a, a simple response or, or technique? Yeah, the, the, answer, the answer to that one is in the brain. It's like our executive function and the frontal lobes are what allow us to do that mm -hmm. because more, our more primitive parts of our brain are reactive. They are survival oriented. So if something's threatening my survival, my primitive brain knows what to do. Fight, flight, uh, flee, sorry, fight, flight, um, freeze, fold, or flock. Those are the five, five Fs. There's more, but, but those are the main ones. Uh, so that's an automatic reaction. That's our automaticity that comes up and, you know, reacts before the thought process begins. So the more self-awareness you have, the more self-reflecting you do, you're able to take that action reaction moment fractions of a second and move it apart a little bit so that the action happens and then you recognize that you are reacting or you move it further apart and you an action happens and you see yourself reacting and you can stop it and then you move the have more of a, a gap in there with more self-awareness and an action happens and you see yourself about to react and then you can not react so this is a building a muscle of mm -hmm. that self-awareness practice that gives you time between the action and reaction so this on the this precipitates is it really a belief system or is it merely a choice and an action that you make in the moment and is that a, an evidence of the level of self-awareness that you have well i'll just use the same model if if this is what's happening action reaction and there's no time gap except microseconds mm -hmm. uh, there is no choice in that because the choice is happening at a lower level of the of physiology your amygdala fires off danger 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 and boom you know you're you're in danger will room. robinson right exactly uh and so th there's no self-awareness in that gap space right as you do develop self-awareness you have more choice you're building your choice up but it takes time and muscle building to get there and then you can be choiceful. Then you can live deliberately. You can decide how you want to be in any particular situation and you can interact in a way that's more conscious. Mm -hmm. Now we're socialized to not respond outwardly. Don't hit the person, talk to them. <laughs> that's supposed to be our early socialization process. Right. Um, but instead of filling us with self-awareness, it's usually a behavioral command. You know, don't hit your brother. And sometimes it's don't hit your brother, you know, which then causes that cognitive dissonance. Like, right, wait, right. Don't tell me not to hit while you're hitting me. Is wrong. Right? Now I'm in confusion, right? So, so uh, you know, self awareness practices at any age are helpful because we recognize, hey, there's there's a lot going on in your consciousness. Like your brain is acting immediately with microseconds of of reaction time. Mm -hmm. So that's happening. But if we can just let it flow and then stay with our present awareness, then that gap widens. Do you feel that because of the transformation from the industrial age to the digital age and the time that we have available now as a result, that that's also giving us an opportunity to kind of step back and, and reflect on where we need to go first before launching into going? Well, that would be nice, but I don't think that's what's happening. I think that with digitization and with microsecond responses, that it's actually feeding our, our immediate gratification needs, you know, gamification, you're playing a game and it's sparking you and keeping your interest. It's, it's grabbing your attention. And for many, it's the, the book enlightenment. It's like the, you know, you, yeah the drive-through right right uh, i want it i want it all and i want it all now right my question is always if you had it all where would you put it but that's a, that's beside the point um, well, so maybe it is the point right if you, and it gets people to think that very question if you had it all you know there's a, a visualization that we did for one of our uh, influencer meetings for the live and let live movement this last weekend of okay what does a peace experience look like for you? What does a peaceful life look like for you? In the future, you've created this peaceful life for yourself. See yourself there. Now bring it back. How did you get there? 
right? That kind of thing. It's a, a Robert Fritz technology. I think you're probably familiar with the eighties, nineties. Um, he had these, this process where you would visualize yourself as you are. You'd have to be honest, right? With where you're at and, and not be bullshitting yourself. And then this future vision of yourself built out and then hold those two visions together. And then it creates what he called structural tension, mm -hmm. which essentially brings the two together. It's not something that you can just, well, I don't know, maybe you can do it just once and it have an effect that's long lasting and you just don't recognize it until a certain, you know, until things start showing up that you visualized, right? Is that something that's possible? Do you see that happening? Has it happened for you? Sure. It works. It's just one of the many things that works. We live in a very complex universe and we're trying to sort out how do we get what we want in a way that doesn't hurt other people, right? Mm. And so uh, visualization is very powerful and it's used by sports teams and, and uh, students, students who visualize them doing, themselves doing well on a test do better on a test. Sports teams who practice internally in their visualization, they have better games, better, you know, the athletes do better. So visualization is a very powerful part of our, our conscious mind that and we can use really for purposes that, that get us closer to what we want. Now, there's still the problem that I see in the enlightenment industry is the law of attraction, which says all you need to do is visualize it and say it over and over again, and it will happen. It, it, it doesn't happen because right. it also takes action in the world. You know, that's that's what I, I was talking about world. earlier, right. the attention, intention, and then the all important interaction. Right. Because you can think and dream all you want and you're just thinking and dreaming yeah. until you take action toward it. And by doing so, then you have committed yourself to that action, energetically even. And it, you know, sometimes it may be with full authority. Sometimes it may be, I don't know, but I'm going to find out, right? And that kind of possibility, don't know. I'm going to, let's try it and find out, right? You, you mentioned, you mentioned my book, Creating on Purpose, which is, yeah. is now, now a program as well. Um, but we use the chakras as a model for the manifestation process. Most people think of the chakras as energy moving up the spine and then out into enlightenment. But the ancients also talked about a downward current, which is taking something from the cosmos, an idea, and moving it down through the chakras where it gets more and more dense. So first you take the idea that's kind of fuzzy. It's like, what would I like life to be? And then you begin to visualize it, which is what you're describing, where, okay, this is how it will be. I can now see it more clearly. It's more, more defined. But then you move it down into communication, into the fifth chakra, and you start talking about it to other people and you get feedback. And then that's that's making it more dense too because you're refining it, you're refining right. it. So you could imagine living in a great house, but then you meet with an architect and he says, well, what, what do you want your house to look like? Oh, just, I just don't want a big, beautiful house. No, no, I, I need to know how many rooms do you want, right? He's making it more concrete. And with enough concreteness at that level, then it can be moved down onto a piece of paper into the third dimension, into a blueprint. Mm -hmm. and so after communicating, then you have to be in relationship with other people. And so I need a real estate agent and I need a, a contractor and I need to, to, you know, a supplier. And so now I've got, I've moved it down into the relationship realm, which is now getting more physicalized because there's a you and a me. And then I have to go to the third chakra, which is power and start actually moving things. I have to pull out the rocks and trees in order to build my foundation of my house. And I have to bring the, the products which are pre-created in, in the world, lumber and concrete and glass, and move them to the place where I can then start building. And then the second chakra is passion. So whenever you're on any kind of project, you're gonna have resistance and, and contrary things happening. The, the, uh, uh, the county says you can't build that kind of house there. Yeah, but I want to build it. Yeah, but you can't. These are the rules, right? So you need the passion to keep you going and allow you to move through the obstacles and the barriers and the resistance that comes up. And then the first chakra is the, your root, right? But it's connected to your legs and your feet. And that's where you take one step at a time forward. Mm -hmm. So that's like baby steps, Bob. That's when the, say again? Baby steps, Bob. Yes, exactly. 
one step at a time. And that's that's the full manifestation process. And then when you create what you have visualized, then you get to enjoy it. And that's the final step, which is completion and celebration, where you get to go, ah, oh, I have my creation. I get to live here. I get to live in this space or I get to, you know, see my product uh, um, sold in the world or I get to see someone transform as, as I coach them. So that's the full manifestation process. It requires all the steps and people get stopped at different levels of that process. So somebody might have great ideas, but they can't communicate them. Or they might talk about them so much that everybody ignores them, or they might go around and try to power people in without engaging them and enrolling them. So you can diagnose the problems of manifestation by, by looking at it through this particular model, which is not true, but it's useful. <laughs> and very useful. Uh, you know, I see the same thing. I, I uh, wrote curriculum and taught business plan writing classes. So important, yeah. And right, because yes, you begin with the vision, the end in mind, but then you have to back that out into black and white and write it down in order to make it happen. That's right. Calendaring this and structuring your days and deciding what to do. And that's, that's all part of our book. It's like, that's so important. That's how you get to the step-by-steps is yep. by knowing what your intention is and what will get you there. So yeah. Very important. And the little details, my dad used to tell me, he says, you take care of the little details, the big ones will take care of themselves, right? It's understanding those incremental micro decisions in every moment that mm -hmm. keeps you on track as opposed to allowing yourself to get diffused and leak energy let's say. yeah beautifully said you said you had a good dad i did um he was 32nd degree mason and uh also very cool uh, no uh, wonder you had no wonder you were handed to him in, at birth <laughs> oh yeah absolutely and and i i didn't go the masonic route i did go through dmla and learned a, a lot of the precepts that are held sacred in the masonic order even before then and so I, I picked it up as like, oh, yeah, well, this all makes sense. It just feels right. And there, are, I found there in that acquiescence, um, but what is it? I found that um, we ascend at the speed of surrender, right? Ooh. And we, we have that intention Lovely. to be our best. And then we have to. The, the questions that we ask are geared towards that. And then we have to ask, acquiesce as to what shows up in front of us to do, because that's the answer mm -hmm. in most cases, right? Yes. That's that practical, pragmatic, concrete in the world, interacting with other and, and processes that need to take place. It's like being your own project manager, right? And being able we to- We are. Absolutely. Yeah. And whether the project is- a house and a family or a global peace movement like i just stepped into recently those all take different models that are useful and the combination of such that finds the most useful things in each and puts them all together in a new model because this is an, an experiment we've never had global peace and yet we all have an idea of what that might look like and with the movement you'll you'll like this i think two different aspects of it there's a legal and a moral the legal side of it the principle live and let live is don't be an aggressor we've already talked about this right makes sense right why would you want to aggress why would anybody want to aggress on another it just doesn't feel good the other side is a moral principle and that's be a good human also with a sense of not being an aggressor well a good human would the a spouse to be a servant or to be fully present in this world in a way that benefits them most self-love and then shares that with others in the interaction process well, that's those are interesting principles, and I like them. I, I work a lot with the virtues, and the virtues are all about making yourself and others happy, and making a happy community and happy world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, 
uh, the admonition, don't be an aggressor, can be misinterpreted by some people, which is to don't use any of your powerful energy. And using your powerful energy in the right way is how we get things done. <clears throat> and children who grow up with, a, with an abusive parent and they say, well, I'm never going to be like them, they sometimes have no personal power because they're not willing to use their own power for their own good uses. Mm -hmm. They've just stopped. They say power is bad. And power is not bad. Power is neutral. Absolutely. Uh, and, and aggression also, I would say, is, is a useful tool at times. If somebody's aggressing you, being a little aggressive is a good response. I make the uh, distinction because yeah. aggression generally means that it's something against another's will. Assertion is something where there's it, there's not the I'm going to overpower you kind of attitude. That it, that you're being a little more um, compassionate. In, in okay, but if but if you, if you're if you come at me with with a knife, and you're aggressing at me against well, me, then, then you better defend yourself. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that was included. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. This, this right. is when, if you're being aggressive upon, then you can defend yourself. So you're, you have the right to defend you. You, no one has the right to tell you how to live, how to work, how to be, how to spend your money, how to build your property, right? Or how to own your property. But laws are, laws are the way that we manage the social order because you said illegal. And so, for example, uh, if I want to uh, ac accumulate all the wealth and leave everybody else starving, because that's what I want to do it, nobody can tell me not to do it, then that's an aberration of the society. And we, need, we do need laws and we do need rules in order to exactly. manage a very complex society. Exactly. The, the, I gave you the short version. The longer version is that anything that includes coercion, fraudulent activity, physical violence, anything of that nature. The laws and legislation has allowed that to take place at some level or it wouldn't be. So what we're proposing long-term is that we address those laws and legislation to remove all possibility of aggression in them. Okay, and then, then you need enforcers to enforce the laws. And that's where we got started with civilization where the king hired a bunch of bullies to make sure everybody paid their taxes sure. and, and the state aligned with what his interests were. So Theory is a different model, if you will. When those things are in place, for instance, open trade, right? Free trade brings peace. The control True. of trade, just the opposite, because you're fighting for something like we were talking earlier, you're fighting for market share. Right. That's not what it is. This is something that when we all learn this, these new principles, if you will, or these old principles, actually, of working together in harmony with each other and honoring the planet, not doing things that destroy it or, or aggressing towards it either. Animals, maybe even the same way, you know, there are those activities that over time won't need the, uh, what did you call them? The uh, um, enforcers, right? Because it's just going to be a way that we are. And I could be wrong. I have a sense that we're that way naturally, internally. We just live the majority of our lives outside and we're bereft of the inner understanding that promotes that. Well, and we've been badly programmed by mm -hmm. the society and the culture and our history and 10,000 years of, you know, of how civilizations have formed. So badly, goodly, is, mm, I, you know, let, let's look at that and, and just see it as it is, perhaps, and that it's all part of a process of a natural evolutionary process for a planetary civilization. I'm, I could go for that. Yeah, I think the, and so how do we move naturally from where we are to where, what that ideal is? That is a great quest and it's an important one. Mm -hmm. Conversations like this are what help it. Yeah. So if you had something to share that could give someone a, a, a tasty tidbit for a daily activity that would help promote their well-being, let's say, 
what might that be? Because uh, my currency is beliefs, uh, I recommend that everybody examine their beliefs in every area of life. And I have an exercise called belief self-diagnosis in my, my eBooks uh, that, you, that actually instructs you on how to do that, to uh, do a process in which you get to just sort of come up with all the beliefs you have in a particular area about sex, about religion, about God, about the self. About sounds really cool. Religion. And and we'll have that in the link below. Yeah. Um, and so if you don't like what your experience is, look at your beliefs, the beliefs that are creating your experience and change your beliefs because I believe they can be changed. Um, and if you don't like what's happening in the world, change your beliefs first, change yourself, and then change how you are in the world. If you don't like other people, change your beliefs about them. If you don't like your work, look at your beliefs about work and then make conscious decisions about what you would prefer to believe. So that's the glory for me is that we get to decide what to believe once we're freed up from the instructional material we've gotten from the past that might have been appropriate when we were a kid, but isn't anymore. Yep. So we have to deprogram those old beliefs and program the new ones based on what we want to create. There's so that that's, choice that's and practice again. Exactly. Yeah. Lion, thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation. It went by really quick. Thank you, Zen. It's a total gas to be with you and to, uh, to talk with you and explore these wonderful and important concepts for the benefit of all. I mean, we are, we are expanding our consciousness together as a We're sharing a, the thought. With you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again, Lion. And Namaste and in la catch. Thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and I will see you next time.